Please open your Bibles to the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews. We'll conclude Hebrews 4 tonight with verses 14 to 16. You'll find it in your pew Bible on page number 1064. Listen now to God's holy, inerrant, and life-giving word, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The grass withers, the flowers fall, and the word of our God abides forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the priestly ministry of your Son and our Savior and all that it means for us. Help us to learn tonight about the ministry of prayer that he serves on our behalf, the opening and the access he provides, the help of the Holy Spirit. Father, encourage us to be a praying people, enlarge our, our confidence in you. Thank you that Jesus has turned your throne into a throne, throne of grace for us. We pray this in his name. Amen. I think a good analogy of the Christian life is that the Christian life is somewhat like a sailing vessel. That's a good illustration because it relates the requirements of following Jesus Christ with the resources that he gives to do them. God's commands, the requirements of of godliness of the Bible, may be thought of as like a rudder. The law of God's that way, the commands of the Bible. A rudder steers the ship. And God's word tells us what to do. The Ten Commandments, for instance, are enormously helpful for decision making. And as we read in the Bible, we receive a lot of insight and commands and wisdom. Uh, This is the way. Walk in it. And so it's like a, a ship being steered correctly. Now that's very important to a sailing vessel that wants to go from point A to point B, and yet it's not enough. You can have the rudder in the right direction, but unless there is wind in the sails, the ship is not going to move. And the Christian life is that way. We may understand the right thing to do. We may have before us the commands of God, but unless we have the grace of the gospel filling our sails, as it were, uh, the, uh, the resources that are ours in Jesus Christ, well, there will not be power for the ship to move forward. Now, the writer of Hebrews is concerned with connecting uh, requirements with the resources that are needed for them. And he has that concern because he's the farthest thing from an abstract theologian. This is a pastor dealing with a church. In chapter 13, verse 22, he describes the book of Hebrews as my word of exhortation. And so it's a sermon, an exhortation to them, and, and he does a lot of that. There's some stern exhortation in this book. There's a, uh, in fact, all of it is very urgent exhortation. And then he's also careful not merely to give them the requirements, but also the resources that will empower them towards them. Now, we're at the end of Hebrews chapter 4, concluding a long exhortation that began in chapter 3. And in this long exhortation, there really is one charge, one requirement that he wants to set before them, namely that they would press on in faith despite difficulties, that they would not harden themselves, but they would receive God's word. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. How often has he brought that up? They are to press on, persevering in the faith uh, in that way. Now, he has therefore also given them some resources. All through our study here, we've been looking at some of the resources. In chapter 3, 13, he mentioned the resource of Christian fellowship. And he says, see to it that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, but encourage one another. One of the reasons we need to be part of a church community. 
One of the reasons we need Christian friends and relationships is that we need encouragement, some resources. If you're leading a, a, a solo Christian life, trying to serve Christ on your own little island, you are uh, not benefiting from one of the important resources that we have and that you and I need to press on, not being hardened, not being deceived. Now, verses 12 and 13 of Hebrews 4 gave us another very important resource, namely the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. God's Word is living. It, it stirs us up in the faith. And how many times I have counseled a couple, perhaps it's a marriage situation, and they come to see me and, and we're talking about the dy- dynamics of the relationship, and I'll just ask the question, oh, do you ever spend any time reading the Bible together? Maybe individually, uh, giving a portion of your day and then talking about it together? Oh, no. I'll say, well, maybe that would help if you did that. Let's, uh, it's one of the resources that God gives you. And then six months later, I'll, I'll get a call from the couple. And by the way, you're, you're happy, I, I don't resent being called. But I'll say, well, remember we talked about reading the Bible? Have you been doing that? Oh, no, we've been too busy. And I will usually say, look, I'm very happy to minister to you, but you're playing to lose. And it's just not that much I can do if you're not willing to make use of the resources that God's given you. Paramount among them all is the Word of God. And so that's a vital resource we can hardly emphasize enough how important it is for you and I to have the power from God. Sometimes people will say, I mean, haven't you read the Bible enough? The answer is no. I mean, do you have to read it every day? I mean, it's not like I'm going to, the world's going to stop if I don't. But you see, I need the power that comes through it. I need to meet with God. I'm in a relationship with him. I need light to shine in my darkness. I need to start the day, not with the world, but with the word. Lest I should be deceived, lest my heart should go astray. I need the resource. You need the resource of the word of God. We cannot afford to neglect it. We're just playing to lose if we do. Well, the third resource this pastor now directs us to is the important resource of prayer. And here in prayer is where we come before the very throne of God, and he says this, that in prayer we receive the mercy and grace, verse 16, the mercy and grace we need to press on in faith, especially in times of difficulty and need. And so I have this metaphor of the Christian life as a sailing vessel, and there are requirements, there's things that we are to do, there's there's things that are to characterize the Christian life. It's like the rudder directing us. Uh, The commands are essential. I remember driving past a church some time ago, it's been a little while ago, and they had a sign that says, uh, no rules, just Christianity. And I said, I don't know what Christianity you're talking about. This is the way, walk in it. There is a pattern of godliness. There is a walk, as Paul likes to use that metaphor. There is a lifestyle. There are commands. There are are behaviors, you bet there are, that are to characterize the Christian. And, And without them, the ship just goes adrift. It runs upon the shoals. It doesn't lead, it doesn't make progress in its calling and destination. And yet, how easy it is to forget that Though they themselves, the commands, simply require these resources by which we, we call them the means of grace. We like to call Second Presbyterian Church an ordinary means of grace church. The word, prayer, the sacraments, worship together. It's what God has given to us. And, and they don't work automatically, but when we, receive, when we receive Christ in faith through the means of grace, it's like wind coming into the sails. We need fellowship. We need God's word. We need prayer. Now that's where the author brings us in verses 14 to 16. And he gives us the good news that with our need for prayer, we may approach God with confidence because of the redeeming ministry of the risen and ascended Son, our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the writer begins this passage by restating the requirement that has been his exhortation for so long in this book, namely the command to persevere in the Christian faith. Look at verse 14. Let us hold fast our confession. That's not only a necessary requirement, but it's also a very difficult thing to do. I remember once talking to a young Christian woman. She was probably in her early 20s. And she once told me how a colleague at work had belittled her Christianity. And he said it was an escape. Maybe you've heard this. 
you know, you can't handle real life, so you've got this escape of yours. You, you've taken an easy route, which is chosen by the weak. I've never forgotten what she said. I forgot what she said. Uh, it was so accurate. She said she looked at him and said, an escape? An escape? Well, then you try to live as a Christian. You wage war with the flesh, the world, and the devil. You seek to lead a spiritual life in a carnal world like this. You seek to be an alien in a strange land. And then you come and tell me how easy is this cop-out that you call Christianity. Well, she's right. If you're looking for a lazy man's detour through life, uh, if you want to follow in the well-worn lanes, then Christianity is the last escape that you should seek. And just Jesus himself taught this, for the gate is wide, the way is easy, that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. But the gate is narrow, and the way is hard, that leads to life. And few there are who find it, Matthew 7 13 and 14. Now that's the stark reality of the Christian faith. To follow Christ is to seek treasures, not here on earth, not here in this life, but treasures in heaven. Now, of course, Christians acknowledge earthly blessings. We seek them in good measure, but we are people who have set our hearts on the heavenly rest. We have stepped upon the spiritual battlefield and we have enemies. It's to be at peace with God, but at war with virtually everybody else, including our own selves, our own sinful desires. This is the time of our labor, the time of our sacrifice. This is the time of our willing self-denial. Why? For Christ and his service with a day of reward that is in the life to come. And so it's no small thing to hold fast our confession. Now that language tells us that it's not merely a lifestyle, however, there is doctrinal content that we must hold fast to. We hold fast to our confession. We know how the early church employed theological formulas like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, coming to the first council of the early church in 325, gave the Nicene Creed. What were they doing? They are articulating the faithful confession. You can find little experts in the new, excerpts in the New Testament of little creedal statements that are there. And it reminds us that there is an essential truth content to the Christian life. There are things we must believe. Now, I'm always amused when people say they're against creeds. I don't believe in creeds. I only believe in the Bible. Well, what does the word credo mean? Credo, I believe. And then if somebody says to you, what do you believe? Whatever answer you give is your creed. I, I remember when I was a professor at West Point, I had a, there was a dear, one of the only evangelical chaplains I knew there, dear Baptist brother, and he was anti-creedal. And I said, uh, Sonny, why are you anti-creedal? He said, because the, well, the Bible is the only rule for faith and practice. I said, thank you for that quote from the Westminster Confession of Faith. I'm glad for the way it built up your understanding of God's truth. What we do in our creeds is we merely admit what we believe. <laughs> We, we think about it, and we hold the, the most important part of the Westminster Confession is it holds the ministers accountable. It holds the church officers that you get to know what standard we will use for in teaching God's word. But we must have doctrinal content. There are things we cannot let go. I dare say one of the great mistakes of 20th century evangelicalism with its pietism it's uh, uh, revivalism. It's, 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 it's making evangelism the only thing. Now, I said this morning that evangelism is the calling of the church, but it is not the thing we do it while jettisoning everything else. In the 20th century, we said, well, let's make it as minimal as possible so as many of us can get along. And the result is we believe less and less and less and less rather than more and more and more. Well, we need a confession. We need robust doctrine that reflects the teaching of the Bible. Listen to J.C. Ryle a century ago. He says, a religion without doctrine or dogma is a thing which many are fond of talking about in the present day. It sounds very fine at first. It looks very pretty at a distance. But the moment we sit down and consider or examine it, we find it's impossible. We might as well talk about a body without bones and sinews. No man will ever be anything or do anything in religion until he believes something. One of the most valuable things we can do with our children is to teach them the system of doctrine. They will have things that they believe and they will understand why they're true. By the way, it's one of the reasons we do our confessions and creeds. Uh, this morning we were doing the Nicene Creed and I think I did think this. I often do. People must think we're insane. 
I, I don't know about you, but I, there's probably not many churches you come to, and they gather all together on Sunday morning, and they recite together a creedal formulation written in the year 325, confirmed in 381. And they will say, well, what about the young people? I think it's great. I want our young people to know we, to the Christian people, the Christian tradition, I mean that in a positive sense, the great Christian movement of Jesus Christ in history believes things, and they're structured on the Trinity. We believe things about God and, and about Jesus Christ. He's very God, a very God, begotten, not made. And, and there's some great lines in there. My favorite one in the under Jesus is, his kingdom shall have no end. I try to pause and punch it as I stand behind Robert in the morning. And then on the, on the uh, and, and he spoke by the prophets. Uh, great truths for us to know. Let's never recite the creeds. Let's confess them. Let's learn them. Let's rejoice. And then let's hold fast to our confession, not just because we memorize them, but because we know that they are true. We believe things and therefore we live as Christians. Let us hold fast to our confession. Now here's what the writer of Hebrews says to the suffering church, that's your requirement. You know, it is essential for, for this congregation, for instance, but the church broader, that as we look for the years ahead, it is absolutely essential that we not let these things go. I, I, it's a temptation for some ministers to say, oh, they've all heard it before. I, I never allow myself to succumb to that. You and I he, need to hear the same old things over and over. I, the sermons I personally prefer are the ones that I'm most familiar with, the, the most basic truths of the Bible, the things that are most important that we've heard. I, I was, uh, yeah, some of you know that uh, I was on the pastoral staff of 10th Presbyterian Church when James Boyce died. And I'll never forget, uh, shortly after that, the preaching, this great man had been preaching there for 32 years, and we were the associates and I was actually the evening preacher Phil Riken was the other preacher and we preached every week but you know when you have Babe Ruth on your lineup you, you tend to think of yourself as an apprentice we never really thought that it was our duty to to move the men around the bases and suddenly the man we thought of as the big hitter was gone and there we were I'll never forget I think Phil and I would both say it was a formative experience we got on our knees together and we said to each other the great mistake would be for us to say oh who are we to preach these things there was this great man, and here we're just kind of the apprentices. Oh, the church doesn't need to hear the things that he preached. They've got them down. And we said to each other, that is what Satan wants us to say. This congregation will lose the gospel fast, despite its great heritage, unless we say, well, Lord, it's us now, so you need to give us the Spirit. And we're going to preach it in the power of the Spirit as well as we can. But the, a great congregation that's been served with great preaching must hear the Word of God, must be taught week by week the most basic things, the things that come from expository preaching, or we will not hold fast the good confession. What a vital and great thing it is that we should do so. Now, that's the requirement. Now, Ryle's point is that is that, is that that is true, that if we're going to persevere, we need bones and skeleton and a confession. And the writer of Hebrew goes on and gives us a reason for this perseverance. What is it, he says, that motivates the Christian people to enter into this life of struggle and strife and, and in a world like ours to hold fast to this confession? Well, the reason is given at the beginning of verse 14 since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us, therefore, hold fast our confession. Now, the reason for us to persevere in Jesus Christ, both in the truth and also in the life of the truth, is because of him, because of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who as God's son and as our great high priest has done this, he has secured salvation for us. The high priest has passed through the heavens. And so as here we are down below, we're teaching these things, we're, we're baptizing little children and promising to teach them our holy religion, and we're going to Sunday school class and we're preaching the Bible, we're doing these things, and, and we're seeking to lead a godly lifestyle. Why would we do that? Because the high priest has come. And he has done the work and he has opened the way that people like us would actually enter into heaven and have eternal life. He has secured salvation for us. Jesus and his saving work here are set forth as the antidote for fear, for, for a sloth, for falling away, 
uh, for fear of even drawing near to God. I find many Christians fear to draw near to God. But Jesus, the high priest, has gone through the heavens and he has opened the way to God. I do think that many Christians struggle in their relationship with God and it comes out in prayer. The dirty little secret of Christianity is that you're not the only person struggling with your prayer life. And I think the writer of Hebrews feels this. And he said in verse 13, no creature is hidden from God's sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And he's talking about the way that God's eyes are upon all of us, but that makes us nervous. Why? Because we are sinners. We're like Adam and Eve. And prior to sin, they walked in the garden with the Lord. They walked and talked with the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ without shame. They were naked, had no shame. There was no reason for shame. And then they sinned and they were naked. Then they they covered themselves and they fled from the voice of the garden. They dreaded the presence of God. They hid as he approached. And we have a tendency to feel that way in our relationship with God. The thought that God is looking at us. What does that make you think? That the eyes of God are on you. You know, in the Bible, when the eyes of God are on his people, we're immediately told that they're with compassion. God saw his people. He saw his people in Egypt, and he had compassion on them. We think that God is looking upon us with disgust, with anger, with wrath. We forget that the high priest has gone through the heavens. No, God is looking on us with love and delight and with mercy. As the bridegroom rejoices in the bride, so your God looks on you with delight and rejoicing. Philip Pugh says, Sinners should no longer keep their distance from God in fear and trembling, but they are invited to draw near and to do so with confidence. For this reason, we have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, who has passed into the heavens. And this is the reason that changes everything. Uh, Jesus has reconciled sinners to God. And there's two aspects of that work that are in view here. First of all, when he went into the heavenly tabernacle, Hebrews 9, we'll talk about him presenting his propitiation on our behalf. When Jesus entered into heaven, he brought in his own person the emblem of his atoning death for our sins. And now he ministers on high with sympathy for our weakness. Now let me say, with these verses, verses 14 to 16 of chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews begins what will be from here on out the dominant theme in the book of Hebrews, namely the high priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this he will emphasize the atoning work of Jesus by dying on the cross. And he sets up a comparison between what Jesus did by rising and or dying for our sins and rising from the dead and ascending into heaven, he compares that with the ceremonial office of the high priest of the nation of Israel. Now you should know that once a year, the high priest on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, he would go through the veil before the Holy of Holies into the very presence of the glory of God. And he carried, when we were reading uh, Exodus in our morning services we read how he wore an ephod and a breastplate and there were 12 stones one for each of the tribes of Israel he was bringing them before them and the problem was he was bringing sin before them and there he is before the holy of holies there's the two cherubim and and there's the glory of God there's the actual 10 commandments broken in the in the box the ark of the covenant what a dreadful scene of wrath certain judgment destruction except that he carried with him the blood of the sacrificial lamb that had died in the place of his people to make atonement for their sins, to cover them. And so he would come and he would bring the blood and he would sprinkle it on the altar. It was called the mercy seat, the tray that would intrude between God's gaze and the broken law. The blood was offered. God would see the blood. The sin was covered I think the great verse, if you ask me what is the central verse of the book of Exodus, it's Exodus 25, 22, meet with me above the mercy seat, for there I will meet with you. God meets with us with grace. He, he, he receives us into favor for blessing. Where? At the mercy seat, because there the blood was poured. And of course, all of Israel's priests, this whole drama of the Old Testament was pointing forward to Jesus Christ. He is the great, look at verse 14, we have the great high priest. 
Now, he's great because of who he is, his divine nature. He is the Son of God, he says. That's why his shed blood is sufficient to satisfy God's wrath forever. The Israelites knew that having a bull die in your place would not cut it. The value of a goat or a lamb is not enough to atone for your and my sins. Ah, but the blood of God the Son incarnate is. And he is the great high priest because of the offering he brings his own blood. He is God's Son. He is great because his sacrifice achieved a finished atonement once for all. Unlike the ones given by Aaron, day after day, the sacrifices, Hebrews will say, the sacrifices proved that they were not effectual because they were offered every day. If it worked, you wouldn't have to do it again tomorrow. But Jesus gives the true atonement. He is the great high priest. It was all pointing to him. And he has gone not merely through the curtain in a physical temple, but he's gone through the heavens, as it were, into the true tabernacle, the heavenly throne room of God. He has offered his shed blood once for all. Now in Revelation, we've been getting a different version of this. Who is worthy to open the seals? The Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain. That is what has made the difference so there is salvation and redemption for the people of God. And unlike Aaron, who was denied entry into the promised land because he was himself a sinner, unlike all the high priests who followed Aaron at that office because they were sinners, they could not offer the true sacrifice, Jesus has gone into the land of rest. He has gone into the heavens themselves and he has finished our redemption. You see, for this reason, those who are joined to Jesus Christ, those who come under his ministry, those who appeal to him to do this on their behalf, they are reconciled to God. And that reconciliation means that now we may approach God freely. We don't have to hide from God. We don't have to feel like Adam and Eve in the garden or the priest who couldn't see where God was because of the veil that has all been torn down by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We may now, as the writer of Hebrews so greatly wants us to see, now we may approach boldly into the presence of God that once was barred by our sin. This is the great reason for our perseverance in faith. Now, this is why the mercy seat was given, the place where the sinners could approach God in safety and in confidence. I mentioned Exodus 25, 22. There I will meet with you above the mercy seat. Now the Greek word for that is hilasterion. Now you say the, Hebrew, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Yes, but the Hebrew scholars wrote a version in Greek in the third century BC. And the Greek word they gave for the mercy seat was hilasterion. And then you thumb your Bible forward to Romans 3.25, the very center of the book of Romans. I like to say this, everything before Romans 3.25 is bad news. You've got a sin problem and he's a holy God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against people like you and me, against all the sin and wickedness. And don't think your works are going to cut it because they don't. This is my paraphrase of the book of Romans. It's all bad news until you get up to Romans 3.25. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's bad, bad, bad. After Romans 3.25, it's all good. It's all justification after that. It's all sanctification. It's all glorification. What is it that happens in Romans 3.25? God set forth his son to be a hilasterion, to be the propitiation, to be the mercy seat. The word given for propitiation, the the thing that sets aside God's wrath, is the same word used in the Old Testament for the mercy seat. See, what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 14, and I do not mind elaborating on so great a theme as this, We have such a great high priest who has passed into heavens. It is the thing that has turned all the bad news into nothing but good news. Everything follows when Jesus Christ fulfills the priestly office, fulfills his priestly ministry. He died on the cross, but then he presented that blood in heaven. Once for all, we have access to God. Because the great high priest has passed for us into the heavens. Now all that's the first point I was talking about, about Christ's priestly ministry. Is what he did on earth, on the cross, and he brought the the fruits of that work, as it were. The proof of that work into the heavens, once for all, finishing the problem of the guilt of our sin. 
But verse 15 makes a second point about what he did when he passed into heavens. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted to sin as we are, yet without sin. Now, some of those points have been made already. In Hebrews 2, he talked about how Jesus had to be, he was going to redeem us. He had to become like us, except for not a sinner. And we've talked about that. That's a very important point. You see, what he's saying here is that the Lord you and I serve, he became like us to redeem us, but also so that in his present state, in his present office above, that he would have a fellow feeling for us. That we would know, that we would be able to look, we'd be able to say, look, I know that he has a fellow feeling for me. Why? Because he proved it. He actually came into the world. He lived in the dust of this, of this life. He suffered more than I've suffered. He has resisted temptation beyond what I have. People said, how can Jesus be human? When he, how, what does he know about sin when he's never given into it? Jesus knows the full force of temptation because he's not given into it. And he is able to sympathize with us. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see how eminently able he is to represent you before the throne of our heavenly Father, to plead your cause, to secure your place, and then to procure for you. He is not only able, he is so willing because he understands to procure the spiritual resources you need. And see, the writer of Hebrews is saying this is why you should not give up. Because Christ has finished the work of atonement on earth. He has gone into heaven to secure salvation for you, having endured the very things and worse that you're going through, yet without sin. And now he is there serving and procuring for you the grace and mercy that will enable you to succeed. His righteousness represents you before the throne of God and secures your access to the Father. His prayers plead for your sustenance. And he intercedes on behalf of you. One of my favorite verses in Hebrews is Hebrews 2.13 where Jesus says, Here I am and the children whom God has given me. Jesus presents us and represents us and, and labors for us. He is our covenant head who has achieved on earth the righteousness we need. He has fulfilled the covenant of works. He has given us the covenant of grace. And now he is in heaven making sure it will bring full salvation to all who belong to him. He has opened the way for you. He's established your place. He will provide you the spiritual uh, resources you need so that you will endure. Now, yes, there will be hardships. There will be troubles. The writer of Hebrews talks about that in a lot of ways. Probably the biggest way he talks about it is his general comparison of the Christian life to the Exodus. This whole section is based on Psalm 95. It's just like the Exodus. And boy, that was a hard time. Life is a hard time. But Jesus will provide all that we need. He assured his disciples on the night before he left, I will not leave you as orphans because I live, you also will live. What a great reason for hope and strength to persevere. Well, the writer gives us a requirement. We are to hold fast to the confession to the whole of Christianity. A reason why we can do that because the great high priest and his ministry for us in heaven, he reconciles us to God and he opens heaven's treasure chest of grace. And with that in mind, then he directs us to the resource that we should not neglect, namely the resource of prayer. Verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, what does it mean to approach the throne of grace? Well, it means to come to God the Father in prayer on the basis of Christ's high priestly ministry. That's what we mean, by the way, when we tag on at our prayer, in Christ's name. That's not just a little label we put. We're saying, oh, and I am coming on the basis of the, the atoning work of the Lamb and the priestly intercession of the high priest who's in heaven above. I am relying upon what he did for my sins and his present priestly intercession on my behalf today. We really are not able to pray. Christians should not pray. I'm not saying that a certain formula of words is mandatory for every prayer, but we should pray only in the name of Christ. There's been pressure on Christians to be willing and 
uh, ecumenical settings to pray other than in the name of Jesus Christ. I do not have the right to lead anyone into the presence of God for grace other than through the name and the ministry and the high priestly work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember once on the missions field in Uganda, and we were doing evangelism, and one of the more extraordinary experiences of my life, I was in this room, and suddenly I realized I was filled with a room with Muslim women mainly, a few men, but mainly women. And part of a very fascinating conversation, a, a woman, one of the women came to me, and there's little naked children running around, and chicken, it's like, wow, I'm on the missions field. It's exactly what you'd think it would be. And this angry woman says, look, we're starving. We're, we're oppressed by the government. We're disempowered. Our children are dying, and yet you come here to talk to me about God. We pray to God every day, and he does nothing for us. I'll never forget the, the words the Holy Spirit gave me to say. I said, what is the name of the God to whom you pray? And she said, Allah. And I said, that is why no one answers your prayers. Because Allah is no God. You must pray to God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not a magic wand. Everything's going to be hunky-dory now. But he'll be your father now. See, the high priest has gone through into heaven. And it's through that Jesus Christ, the only Savior, the only meteor that you can really pray. And then you'll have access. Not that all your trials will be removed, but to the mercy and grace you so greatly need. We are to approach the throne of grace. Now the language here is very striking and clear by telling us to come before God's throne. The author reminds us that this is the place where the blood has been offered for us. Again, the mercy seat where God calls sinners to meet with him. We're reminded that it is to a king that we come. It is a throne of the royal king of kings. Now, Charles Spurgeon preached a sermon on this text, and he worked out some of the implications of this for our approach to prayer. First, he says, we should approach God in prayer in lowly reverence. Why? Because we are coming to a high and holy sovereign. When you and I pray, God loves us, God's our heavenly father, but that does not mean that we've become pals and we just kind of casually discourse to him as we would with anyone else. But I just saw an article just this last week showing that Abba does not mean daddy. It means dear father. (laughs) And uh, it's been shown that Abba was a word, you know, the the, the Aramaic term that Jesus uses, Abba, father. And people say, oh, yes, it's daddy. No, actually, it's, it's dearest father there's a tone of reverence now there's familiarity to be sure there's a bond of love but there's a bond of respect as well and we are to come before God Spurgeon says in lowly reverence if we show great respect in the courts of earthly majesty in the white house and a royal palace in the governor's mansion in Columbia well surely we will come with even greater reverence in the throne before the throne of God in heaven. This is why our worship services should be characterized with gravity and reverence. This is not a call for pride or vanity, but if our eyes could see visually before us what is really true, this is where the book of Revelation is so helpful, Revelation 4 with the, with the throne and the, and, the, and the rainbow above it, what we would realize is the awe and majesty of God and his throne. Surely we should come with reverence. Spurgeon says his throne is a great white throne, unspotted, clear as crystal. There may be familiarity, but never unhallowed. Boldness, there should, yes, there should be, but let it never be impertinent. Now, secondly, we should come when God to God in prayer with great joy. Why? Because of the favor that has been extended to us in so high a privilege. What we have merited is rejection from God's presence. And yet here we have access as dearly beloved children into his presence. I think it's one of the more important things for our daily lives that we would realize the joy that we should have in prayer. We are burdened down with responsibilities. We are overworked in so many cases. There are things we deeply care about and we're not sure how well they're going and we're not sure how well we're doing and our lives can be burdened and crushed. And God says, don't forget with joy that you can pray to me. Cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Let's rejoice in our prayers that we do have a God who loves us and cares for us. He invites us into his presence for mercy and grace in time of need. A third Spurgeon says our prayer should involve enlarged expectations. We should come to God reverently, joyfully, 
but also believing that great things can happen to us in prayer. Why? Because of the goodness and the power of the one to whom we come. Now here is, I think, something that most of us uh, need to think about in our prayer lives. Very often it becomes sort of a sentimental act of loyalty. Lord, we're not really sure anything's going to happen, but you know, we want to show that we care enough, and so we're going to pray about this person who's sick and that person. What we need to do is to learn that God is able to do great things, and I think it would be good for all of us to start praying, and often it will be relational things. Lord, I've got a relationship. Lord, I'm asking you to do what I can't do, but it's a good thing. It's in accordance with your word, or often it's a character thing. You know, there, Lord, there's a way, that, there's an attitude that I have, and it hurts people, and it goes on and on, and maybe I'm a, I, I tend to be angry, maybe I tend to be defensive, well, whatever, we've all got them. If you're not sure what you have, just ask your friends <laughs> and your spouses, because they know. And if we're to say, Lord, would you encourage me? I'm going to pray for this. Would you do a great thing in my life? Would you move me forward in holiness? Would you let me remove this obstacle of blessing? Would you give me a virtue? Would you give me zeal that I've not had? Uh, and, and, and wait to see if he will do it. I like to use the analogy of, of uh, myself as a father. If I had a child and there was something that I wanted that child either to stop doing or start doing, and of course my children know that that kind of thing happens, it should happen fairly regularly. And if they came to me and they said, oh, by the way, Father, you have the power to give us the thing that you ask us for. Maybe it's self-control, discipline, uh, obedient speech, that kind of thing. Uh, Now, if they came to me and said, Father, you have asked for this. You have the power to give it to us. We desire to desire the things you want. Would you give it to us? Here's a question. Would I? You bet I would. And when you and I open up the fruit of the Spirit and say, Lord, I really don't have this. I'm not gentle. I'm not patient. I'm not self-controlled. And I see you want me to be that way. But I need your power. I need the Holy Spirit's ministry. Here's a question. If we pray for our characters in a bold way, expecting great things, well, we will find that he will do it. We need to enlarge our vision. Our church is embarking in the next year or so as a partnership to plant another church in Charleston. We told you that during the budget process, and more information will come as we can give to it. Right now, pray for a presbytery meeting. Uh, next week, the Presbytery is meeting, and it's gone well, but please be praying that Palmetto Presbytery would look favorably upon our church plant. And that whole endeavor that I look forward to being, Lord willing, a significant uh, work of the kingdom of God that we'll be involved with and blessed began with a conversation between two pastors who said, well, let's pray for God to bless this. And let's look, wouldn't it be great if God would give us the opportunity to pr- plant a, a vigorous downtown church in a great city like that with, uh, with ordinary means of grace and reverent worship and all these things, wouldn't that be great? Well, let's start praying and asking, and here we are. He's doing things. And he said, we, we don't do enough of that. Let's enlarge our expectations. Maybe you would say, Lord, wouldn't it be great if we could support a missionary? We've never supported a missionary. Never had the money to do it. Lord, would you show me how to manage my money better? so that I would be able to do something I've never done. I could get in the game in a way I've never been in. Lord, I'm going to ask you to do something new in my life. We need to have high expectations. It's a throne of grace. He will do it. But we need to combine that with submission to his will. He receives us. He's eager to bless us. He gives mercy and grace. He provides resources. But thank God it's according to his wisdom. I thank God that his wisdom is not overridden by my folly. I thank God that his omniscience is not overridden by my ignorance. I thank God that God does not answer my prayers in the way that I think I want him to answer them. And we need to be willing to submit to the way that he does. One of the great examples from church history, you probably know, is Monica, the mother of the man who became St. Augustine. And he was a dissolute sinner, and he wanted to go to Rome because that's where you could really sin. And uh, she says, Lord, don't let him go there. And she does a prayer night, all night vigil of prayer. Don't let him get on the ship. She gets out of her prayer vigil, he's on the ship. And she's like, why did I spend my night praying? And he goes to Rome and is converted. (laughs) Let's let God be sovereign over our prayers. He knows our hearts. Let's submit to his wisdom and will for it. And finally, here's a special point being made by the writer of Hebrews. Let us pray with confidence. Let's be eager to come to God in prayer, to commune with him in prayer, to to receive grace from him in prayer, to talk to him and and to have him nurture our souls. And then, yes, to seek from him the things that we need. Why should we be so confident? Because of the great high priest 
who has dealt with our sins once for all. It is no longer an issue between us and God except for his fatherly need to discipline us in this life. It is no longer a barrier to his grace, and there is Jesus Christ ministering on our behalf. What confidence we should have. The access given for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I know how Christians struggle with prayer. We tremble with stage fright as if the light from God's throne would expose the poverty of our prayers. In fact, and God's light shines upon us with mercy and love and compassion. Here is the key to pray, prayer, the key to praying often, the key to praying openly, the key to praying boldly and freely and gladness of heart to know that you come through the ministry of Jesus Christ that you stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ, to know that your access is purchased with his blood, that he himself is inviting you there, that he himself is carrying on a priestly ministry on your behalf. Here is the secret to lively and happy prayer, to realize all that Jesus has secured for you in your relationship with God. Yes, it is a throne to which you come, but that throne is a throne of grace. And that means that when you come, your sins are covered by the blood of Christ. Your faults are looked upon with compassion. Your stumbling prayers are not criticized, but are received with kindness. And Paul writes in Romans 8.26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Our Lord, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, helps us in the feebleness of our prayer and finally because it is a throne of grace to which we come how ready God the father is to grant what we need he is glad to provide for his children to give us strength especially this strength to persevere under trials my grace is sufficient for you he says and my power is made perfect in weakness second corinthians 12:19 Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, why do we come? Well, one commentator writes, man needs mercy for past failure and grace for present and future needs. Mercy is to be taken as it is extended to us in our weakness. Grace is to be sought according to our daily need. Well, God requires us to persevere in faith. He requires you to do that through the trials and temptations of the Christian world. And he gives you reasons to press on, the saving work, the intercession, the the salvation that Christ has opened up for you in heaven. He can save us to the uttermost. He has opened the doors and unlocked the treasures of God's mercy and grace. And he gives us the great resource of prayer that we must not neglect if we are to grow strong in faith and persevere. Prayer brings us to a throne of power and authority, but also a throne of grace. Let us therefore draw near, as we've said, with reverence, with joy, with enlarged expectations, with humble submissiveness, and with confidence, confidence that belongs to the children of God. Well, I can do no better in summing this up than with the words of Charles Spurgeon. I want to close with this. He says, I could not say to you, pray, not even to you saints, unless it was a throne of grace. Much less could I talk of prayer to you unbelieving sinners. But now I will say this to every sinner here, though he should think himself to be the worst sinner who ever lived. Cry unto the Lord, seek him while he may be found. There is a throne of grace prepared for you. Go to your knees. By simple faith, call upon Jesus as your Savior. For he, he it is, who is for us the throne of grace. Let's pray. Well, Father, help us to benefit from the knowledge of what Jesus has done for us and help us to be changed and affected in the way that we think and act because Jesus, the great high priest, has gone into heaven for us. Lord, would you particularly give us a new boldness and expectation and confidence in prayer You say we have not because we ask not. Oh, Lord, let that not be said of us. Thank you for the throne of grace and the great high priest who has opened up your mercy for us. We pray in his name. Amen.